Good evening, guys. It's morning for me, but good evening for you. Um, we are going to start our first flipped video uh, by taking Harvard Notes. Uh, this is over the Renaissance, so at the top of your page, just title your notes, the Renaissance, um, and we'll talk about how this is a rebirth of the classical era or classical ideals. We are going to use Harvard Notes in case you forgot. Um, you'll have a skinny column, a fat column, and then a small summary at the bottom, but I want to make sure that you are only writing notes in the right-hand column, the big fat notes column. Don't write in the main ideas column. That'll be part of your opener tomorrow. We're going to start this off by talking about the Dark Ages. We left off um, historically with the fall of Rome. The empire had split, it had degraded in the West, and Europe essentially fell into nothingness. It's not really nothingness, it actually develops into what we'll call feudalism or feudal society, which is basically an economic and political system based on peasants working land for lords and lords controlling their own territory. This makes leadership um, and really economics weak and, and kind of decentralized or localized. And it makes um, control of land based on sort of a patronage system. So a wealthy noble would have to sort of have his own knights and sort of military to defend his own castle. There's no central government, so there, again, there's no central protection from government. Another reason for the Dark Ages could have been the Black Death or the Bubonic Plague. It's believed to have wiped out over a third of Europe, and really the impact of the plague is twofold. At first, it decreases labor supply so much that Europe kind of falls into the feudal system even more. But eventually they start to realize that that value of labor can make you increase a little bit. Um, in terms of rights and wages and property. Okay? If there's nobody to work the farms because there is such a small labor supply, then nobles can't really be nobles anymore. Um, this is going to allow people to rebound and go into the Renaissance or the rebirth, but it's going to be a little bit difficult. One thing that I think is interesting is that one of the stories of how the plague got started in Europe is that the Mongols were invading and they were sieged outside of a major castle and in an attempt to break the siege they launched a dead body that was um, infected with the plague over the wall and it killed the whole city from the inside and it spread from there. I think The early Renaissance, again Renaissance meaning rebirth of ancient and Greek and Roman ideas, the early Renaissance starts in Italy and it's essentially a time of cultural borrowing. They take things from the old um, classical era of Greece and Rome and they kind of merge it in with what they know now. It happens between the 14th and 17th centuries, um, much stronger early on and then it sort of fades out in the end. But we start to see new gains in economics, politics, and artistic endeavors. There are three causes, and you're going to need to become familiar with this plant diagram shown on the side. Um, it'll help you remember it. In order for the Renaissance or this plant to grow, you need a couple of things. You need soil, you need um, water, and you need sunlight. So the soil being the growth of city-states. And we had city-states in ancient um, Greece, but they start to kind of rebound and become a little more prominent. The water is the increase of travel and commerce. This brings in new ideas and old ideas and allows for wealth to be um, increased throughout Italy. And the sunlight is this rise of humanism. Humanism is a new term and we will talk about that here in a minute. Okay, We're going to break each one of these down. So if you didn't get to write them in order, just leave some space in between them. The growth of city-states is incredibly important because, like I said, with the, after the fall of Rome and during the Middle Ages and the Dark, or the Dark Ages, Italy didn't have a strong central government. So little small kingdoms had to develop. And these small kingdoms eventually turn into cities because their population grows and you start to see the places like Milan and Florence and Venice. And these places are able to remain independent over time, um, creating urban centers. And with every urban center, you need food. And so that surrounding territory is going to create a city-state. These new political territories are often run by what are called constitutional oligarchies. A constitution is just a written form of government, so everything is documented. And an oligarchy is the power of the few. 
Okay, and the few in this case being wealthy merchants, and I'll explain that, that kind of carries over into the next one. But this growth of urban society allows wealth to be concentrated and therefore increased in society, which increases possibilities for everybody. The increase of travel and commerce um, happens a little bit earlier. It usually is uh, given credit to start during the Crusades of the 11th century. And this is starts out as a negative thing, but that negative relationship between the East and the West eventually becomes positive. Once the Crusades die down and once that's no longer a priority for Europe, um, they have a connection and that connection turns into a trading connection. Not only are you trading physical things, wealthy wealth and resources, but you also start to trade ideas. And most of the ideas of ancient Greece and Rome were actually kept in the East, not in the West, which gives them an opportunity to come back. Okay. Um, as I said before, in these constitutional oligarchies, the merchants were, were the powerful. And one of the reasons is because they are responsible for bringing back all of that wealth, which makes them in turn wealthy individuals, giving them the opportunity to be more powerful. You can see this map, this sort of just shows all of the different trade routes. You have the Silk Road overland trade that's pretty old. Um, which takes a long time. It goes through deserts, it goes through mountains, it goes across rivers and streams. Um, it will take a long time to get something from China all the way to Europe. So something that's unique about this time period is people from Venice, which is in Italy, it's in the northern part, um, people from Venice start to develop ships that will allow them to travel further and longer. And you can see the orange line going all the way down through the Indian Ocean will give them quicker access to the east, which allows them to trade directly to um, Africa and Asia. There are a lot of profits in this, and these, this profit eventually gets pumped through society, and people start to feel this wealth and have free time, essentially, to do things that they'd like. The third cause is the rise in humanism. Okay, um, Humanism is a philosophical thing. It's not really something you can touch or feel like the increase in wealth or city-states, but it is something that is maybe the most important. Um, during the Middle Ages, people focused primarily on their faith, and that faith in Europe was Catholicism. And around the time of the Renaissance, people start to realize that you have, as an individual, you have the ability to do things that you can determine, okay? Um, everything isn't determined by God. So you have to sort of balance that religious Catholic faith that has existed for a long time in Europe with your new, newfound knowledge that you have the ability to do things, okay? It's the same thing you're told when you're young, that you can do anything you want as long as you try. That's kind of a humanistic idea. And that's what the people in the Renaissance believed. The guy who comes up with this is a guy named Francesco Petrarch. He's the one who coins the Dark Ages because he believed that he was living in a new time period of intellectual achievement. He believed that people were coming out of the Dark Ages and into this new rebirth or this new Renaissance. Um, and he believed that it was only going to happen because of individuals. He's the guy who t comes up with humanism. There were more than just Petrarch. There were more people that were significant. And we'll call these people Renaissance men because Renaissance men are people who have many talents. They are well-rounded. They are individualistic. They do what comes to them. Um, and they don't just limit themselves to one trade or one career. They have no limits. And uh, you'll see some of the more famous ones and hopefully you make the connection. Um, but they, they were writers, architects, artists, scientists, um, all kinds of different trades. The most famous Renaissance man is da Vinci and we'll see some da Vinci paintings along with some other achievements. I want you to take a second to write a few of these characteristics down, probably try to get five because we're going to talk a lot about these later in the week. I'm going to just flip through really quickly and kind of give you things to, to note for each of these paintings or pieces of art. Notice that in Raphael's School of Athens, you see a lot of depth 
It looks three-dimensional, um, like you could really walk down this hallway. There's a lot of color that's different and unique, and people aren't really posing for the picture. They're just kind of hanging out, doing what they would naturally do. And that's those are three characteristics of Renaissance art that get repeated over and over. In the Sistine Chapel, you're going to also see that there are realistic images. There, Not only is it realistic, but there's also depth, color, they mix religion and non-religious scenes um, all throughout the Sistine Chapel. It's pretty amazing, and that's Michelangelo's. Donatello didn't do much painting, but he was a, an amazing sculptor. Um, this is Caesar riding a horse, and it doesn't really look much different than other sculptures from the past, but one thing to notice is that Caesar is life-size compared to this horse. He's not bigger than he should be. And in classical art, you would have had misproportions to show the significance of someone. So Caesar would have been shown much bigger than this horse, even though it's not truly realistic. So you, that realism is there. And our last one is da Vinci, and he has several paintings showcasing all of the characteristics of Renaissance art, like religious scenes and depth, he has the scientific achievements of the Vitruvian man. He has the color and the shading and the realism of Mona Lisa. He is truly our Renaissance man. Hopefully you notice that these are all Ninja Turtles. That's the easiest way to remember Renaissance men is to know that they are Ninja Turtles. Um, we're going to end the notes here. Make sure you have your Harvard notes for tomorrow morning at the beginning of class so we can come by, check them, and finish our big ideas. Have a wonderful evening.